Hi, everybody. Um, I'll introduce myself now. I'm Stephanie. I'm based in London. And here I work as a designer, artist, and author. And I mainly work on an ex experimental data design project. And the best way that I found to describe the work I make is to say that I'm a designer whose favorite creative material above all others is data. So instead of using photography or pencil or video or whatever to communicate about or respond to a subject, data is the material that I choose to work with. And when I work in this way, I will try to create work or communicate a message that's often more emotive or subjective than what you would find in a more traditional chart or data viz. Um, also, um, a lot of the work, or probably the majority of the work that I make, is really for all age communities outside of the world of art, design, and data, where I'm not preaching to the choir, but I have to find ways of presenting data that best serve these audiences, where in order to connect and communicate with them, one has to move beyond maybe more clinical or colder forms of representing data to something uh, that's quite warm and playful and personal. Also, um, well, and I'll be talking about communities today, but um, in my practice, I aim to explore ways of presenting data that is more memorable and more expressive to a layperson audience who might just be learning about data for the first time. So that might mean making data hoppable, like this open data playground that was at the South Bank Center in London, where hopscotch games were created from open data sets in order to communicate how open data sets are published online for anyone to interpret and play with however they choose. So here I'm creating work to appeal both to small children who just need a place to jump around and also to adults and parents who are standing by watching, telling them this deeper message about open data. Um, it could also mean a project that's touchable and wearable, like this art commission I created with Miriam Quick where we explored physical ways of communicating open air quality data from Sheffield in a memorable experiential way for a citizen audience who might not be interested in air quality or data in general. So one part of the project presented weeks of particulate matter data as something you could touch and wear. And then the other part communicated a day of pollution levels in Sheffield through glasses that would make your vision more or less polluted and hazy depending on the data. Or finally, serving a specific community could mean commemorating their data collection, like in this piece that was uh, once up at the Olympic Park in East London, which was made using data school children collected from the park, not for any statistical insight, but to inform a mural design serving, uh, you know, kind of celebrating a group of 10 to 11 year old school children, where I wanted to make something from their data that would be playful, bright and appealing to them. Um, but most important of all in this process of designing specific visual responses for specific, I guess, uninitiated layperson communities, I spend a lot of time crafting the experience they have when they interact with these projects. And over time, I found common patterns for how these experiences are shaped. And so I'll discuss this in more detail today. Um, much of what I learned about data experiences actually stems from a project created with Georgia Lupi, where um, a New York based information designer where together we came up with a project we called Dear Data, a year of sending each other hand drawn data postcards back and forth across the Atlantic. In this project, every week we would collect our personal data around a shared topic. Um, and then um, once this data was collected at the end of the week, we would analyze it, draw our visualizations, and then legends on a postcard, then post uh, the postcard to the other person. And then if all went well, the postcard would arrive at the other person's address. And then we'd sit down with the postcard and learn more about the other person's life. Um, so this project lasted a year and it culminated in 52 weeks of personal data sets and custom visualizations. And so some of the examples of the ones I created are on screen. Um, so the, obviously that's a super quick run through, but you can also find the project in book form. Um, and then the original collection was acquired um, by MoMA in New York in 2016. Um, but the best news of all really um, from this project um, is that uh, we found that this manual way of introducing people to data really resonated with them. Um, so lots of people started Dear Data projects and um, it's also become part of the curriculum for students of all ages to help them learn to collect and present data. And because of this wider interest, it was then that we published a journal to make the data 
design process less intimidating to a newcomer. Observe, collect, draw, a journal that can be used, like the name, to observe the, your world um, around you through collecting its data and then drawing it. And if I circle back to this idea of data experiences, uh, one of the biggest influences in how I shape like a, a data experience for a wider audience comes from what I've learned through creating this journal. And so here's how the journal works. So um, on most of the, it's like lots of spreads and on the left page, there are always data collection prompts and data drawing rules that can be customized by the reader or user. And then on the right page, um, by following the drawing rules, the reader can draw their data and then visualize their life. And so let's just look at the breakdown of the data experience that the journal gives the reader. So first there's this like close ref reflection on something, this per um, looking at the personal data collection, the observing and collecting where the reader needs to spend time observing their personal world in a way they might not do otherwise. Um, then they draw or visualize that data by following the instructions in the journal. And then when it's complete, this reveals to the reader a different angle on their lives and the process hopefully reveals new truths. Um, and then finally, after the drawing, you say there's this like one last step in the process, the sharing, like, cause theoretically, you know, people can share their drawings with others on social media or their friends to compare and see how they fit in with the other people who are working through the journal. Um, so these are like the different ways that someone would move through this um, experience. And this is one um, kind of flow through that I use often. Um, and since finishing this journal, I've uh, used sim a similar process to start um, um, for not just on an individual level, but on a community level um, in a lot of uh, my practice. And so I'll share a couple of these projects now. So I first started using data collection and visualization as a community conversation starter a couple of years ago when I was the artist in residence at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London. And uh, when I was a resident there, um, I became fascinated by the collection of Royal Navy ships badges that were on the walls around my studio door. And often witty and playful in their imagery, these Royal Navy ships badges function as the visual identity of a ship, similar to a more traditional coat of arms. And while observing museum visitors, I began to see them as a fleet of ships where every visitor ship brought their unique personality as their cargo into the museum. So I decided that these visitors should also be commemorated with their own ships badges made from their personal data. However, you know, so I needed to kind of get data to create an artwork from it. And so I needed to create a data collection experience that would appeal to visitors of all ages and then also be thankful of their data contribution. Um, my data collaborator on the project, Miriam Quick, uh, created surveys appropriate for children and adults that collected a mixture of basic demographic data as well as questions about their personalities and then also which single word they would use to describe themselves. And uh, we, would co we collected data over five days through setting up a stall where we invited people to take our survey and then learn what ship they'd be based on their personality. So the survey took a few minutes to fill out and then when completed, we would use the lo-fi decoding tool on the left to assess their survey responses, determine which ship they would be, and then we'd give them a giant literal ship's badge that I designed of that ship so they'd like stick on their chest and walk around the museum. Um, then we gave the participants further context through displaying a tally board showing how many of each ship type took the survey and then the color indicated where the survey taker was from. So this was um, before the pandemic, so from a lot of places. And the final count on the day, so 600 survey responses to create an artwork from. Where we really thought a lot about this data collection experience and made sure that it offered multiple points for museum visitors to learn about themselves in the museum, where some people really enjoyed reflecting upon their answers to the survey. Others were most amused by that insight of figuring out what shift they would be. And then others were more interested in just seeing how the results compared with others on this tally board. Now, as for the final artwork, when the data was collected, the most evocative part of the survey was the one word visitors used to describe themselves. So we use this as our main mode of organizing our data. I made uh, sketches and decided um, where organ to organize the data where, yeah, every word used by visitors to describe themselves is one badge where demographic data like gender and age is informs the frame of the badge and then 
um, the internal watery scene is created from visitors' personality scores, where um, in this scene, the five facets of the personality test were visualized by the chosen animal and what they were holding, what they were sitting in, and the weather and the sea behind them, where every element of the scene has a reason behind it. And so this is a sample of what these badges looked like, each representing these aggregated responses for each word, uh, where each of the 177 created badges is uh, totally unique. Um, and this is the uh, final piece on the wall where this work offered a space for visitors of all ages, you know, non-data, non-art, to enjoy this artwork in different ways, where it functioned on multiple levels for multiple and mostly younger audiences. Now, uh, that way of working then led into a more, I guess, my latest art commission uh, called Updating Happiness. And uh, this is a piece that was commissioned by the Wellcome Collection in London. Um, and they are a museum and library exploring health and human experience. And they do this through commissioning artists to respond to various health topics. And I was brought on board by the curators to create what they called an emotional check-in for exhibition visitors that would give them the opportunity to think about their perception of happiness. So when I was researching this project, I became uh, really interested in the insipid happiness quotes that seem to take over Instagram. So they all have a very particular aesthetic with pink backgrounds and people reaching up to the sky, beaches, sunsets, and so on. And so for me, I don't really like these quotes. I think they're really superficial and they don't really explore what makes us happy and they don't paint a diverse picture of happiness. So I wanted to find a way of taking these quotes and making them better. So how did I achieve this? Well, I created a work where to start, participants are invited to take a two minute survey either online or on their phones in the gallery. Um, and the survey asks you your age along with four questions adapted from the UK's Office of National Statistics for measures of personal well-being, which are on screen. Um, so participants can get a sense of the measures that the UK and other countries have found are best to measure well-being. So, you know, asking questions like how satisfied are you with your life now or, how, you know, how much, how, you know, how much do you feel that your life is worthwhile? And then yesterday, how happy or how anxious did you feel? And then um, these aren't from the INS, but I made them up. The user can choose four, one of four questions to answer about their perception of happiness, to, like elicit kind of a diverse range of answers. Like, you know, what's the small thing you're most grateful for? What guilty pleasure secretly makes you happy, but is too embarrassing to tell anyone about? That's my favorite. Or what makes you feel better about after a bad day and so on. So they all, like the person then enters their data, they press enter and then instantly receive a quote based on their responses that they can add to a growing collective archive of reflections on happiness. And this is an actual guilty pleasure uh, that somebody did submit to the project on screen. And then they also have, participants also have the option to download and post on their own social media feeds so they can populate the internet with more nuanced ideas of happiness. And then the collective responses are, of course, displayed online where the super bright colors are meant to be the opposite of the typical pastel Instagram quotes. And then they're displayed in various places in the gallery through projection, printed on wallpaper or displayed on the gallery's external facade as well. Where, you know, this experience follows like the same model of the journal on the National Maritime Museum. You know, they have this chance for a reflection in looking inward at themselves and thinking about these ONS questions, then they have this um, insight or surprise, or so this like surprise of what their quote looks like, and then they see themselves in context with everyone who's participated. Um, and then uh, here are some examples of some that people have created so far, where again, every aspect of a design from the shapes, color palette, and font are directly informed by their survey answers. So you can go to the link to try it for yourself. Um, if you happen to be in London, the in-person exhibition is up through the end of March. Okay, so just to round off these projects with one more project, which is like sort of related, but not, but I just want to talk about it. <laughs> um, so it's a project that bring, is still focusing on the idea of data experience, but a little bit differently. So it's bringing this idea of a data experience back into the form of a book, but one that is different to the journal. And this is my recent book with my friend Miriam Quick. I mentioned her name a lot. We work together all the time. I am a book. I'm a portal to the universe, and it's published by Penguin in the UK. 
And uh, this book was a response to the traditional infographic book. You know, this is a very innovative format. Like a decade ago, it transformed the data design landscape. It's one that both Miriam and I have worked on in the past, but we feel like it hasn't really changed much si since. And so it's feeling a little well, well worn. So we asked ourselves, how can we make something that is different than the standard info book? And what does that mean in practice? So we came up with a new idea for what we originally called the measuring book, where the book itself would be a measuring device that could be used to measure things. Um, and then we wanted it to be a book for almost everyone from children age eight and up to adults, so quite a broad range. And then our goal was to write for the data uninitiated or data intimidated. So again, people who wouldn't pick up, pick up a book with data or science in the title. So we wanted the book to be accessible enough for children, but entertaining enough for adults with a bit of humor and bite to it. And finally, our golden rule and also biggest constraint is that all of the data sh should be represented on a one-to-one -one scale printed on the page at actual size. And so this is like, the big thing about the book, where by representing the data at one to one scale, we really hope that the reader's lived experience and interaction with the data would hopefully make the data more memorable, directly rooted in their world. Um, so that was really important. It's just like kind of just direct um, kind of connection to the world around them. So how did we do this? Um, well, the book is not like any other kind of data informed info book that you've seen before. So it's a book that doesn't have any charts and it doesn't have any infographics. Um, but instead, it only communicates its data using what we call its bookie superpowers. So it's ink, it's typeface, page size, thickness, volume, weight, and more. Where um, we might use the double O's within relevant words to represent to scale the actual size of various animals' eyes in a spread or you might have to drop the book from waist height to understand how fast it moves through the air. Slam it shut as hard as you can to hear how noisy sunshine would actually sound if space wasn't a vacuum. Or find out exactly how many stars are born and exploded during the time it takes to turn a page. So this is not an ebook, it never will be. No, <laughs> very difficult to release a book like this in the middle of COVID, but but we did it, yeah, okay. Um, but anyway, so after two and a half years of hard work, did we succeed in making a book that went beyond the usual info book? Well, the best news ever, we're very proud. Just yesterday, we learned we won the Royal Society's Young People's Book Prize 2021. Um, this is a prize that, in their words, supports the writing of excellent accessible STEM books for under 14, so we're very happy. Um, if you don't know what the Royal Society is, it's the oldest national scientific institution in the world. Isaac Newton was once its president. So this is a huge honor from an awesome institution. Um, and best of all, like while the shortlist was named by a panel of adult experts, the final decision was based on the voting of 11,500 wonderful young people <laughs> aged 8 to 14. Um, and their decision to vote us the winner is testament to the fact that these kind of experimental approaches that Miriam and I are exploring are actually like working and engaging. So, you know, it's not just me spouting hot air in a talk like this one, but people and young people respond to these embodied ways of presenting data. So to sum up some of the main things I've learned when creating data projects for uninitiated communities or audiences, um, firstly, the process on screen is a good place to start where you give the participant a chance both to look at the details like an inward, reflect, and then find themselves in the bigger picture and like look outward. Um, also, um, you know, I really believe in the value of more embodied experiential approaches to representing data for a wider audience where a reader experiences data directly in front of them on their scale. And um, further exploration of this approach, I think is quite an interesting way of moving the data design space forward. And finally, I think all these projects are a reminder that while data collection and visualization should always be seen as a, a conversation starter instead of something that shuts down debate, I think it's just really interesting that it can also offer a new way to start new conversations with new communities that are outside of the usual audiences for data viz as well. Thank you.